There we go. Good evening, Hang ladies up, wait, and gentlemen. Wait, 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 wait. That that was a professional clean start. What what was that? I, do you know, I'm just feeling it today, man. I'm just feeling it. I just I thought I was gonna I thought I was gonna like do it properly for a change, and we were on time, and I was like. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna fucking introduce the show straight away and I'm gonna I'm gonna feel like I'm doing it properly for a change. You see, we need to have an overhang about something completely, completely appalling. Oh yeah, like we normally we normally just kind of start the chat midway through a conversation where somebody's making like a really gross joke or something, don't we? Yeah. You may as well go for it, Steve. Has anybody got a good dick joke? Yeah, but Chris ain't here tonight. <laughs> So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Vape Talk UK, episode 141, The Special Relationship. A uh, bit of a clue as to what's going on in that title, but you will notice a very tiny, sparse number of participants right now. Um, Chris JB got locked in at his local KFC. Um, he was going to seconds, weren't he? Yeah, it's, they do lock-ins now at his, at his KFC. It's, you know... It's a new thing. Um, so he's not going to be with us tonight, unfortunately. And and Chandler's running late because he's just a terribly organized person. So, you know, that's, that's just a thing. Thing for his show. For his show, he's incredibly organized. Oh, um, oh yeah. Well, he will be for his show. The, the, I mean, this, is the, this is the plug. Um, go check out this week's Vaguely Vaping related podcast. Um, uh, completely inappropriate because I was on it. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we, it remember, you have to always keep in mind we are Chandler's third favorite vape show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. It's a real shame. I wish I wish we were his favorite, but he just he's not that keen on us. We're, we're just that annoyance on a Tuesday night. Yeah, we're just that thing he has to do now because his mates roped him into it. You know. <laughs> thing is, if we keep giving him enough free shit, then he'll feel too guilty to ever leave us. So, you know. That's the way we keep him. That's the way we keep him. Uh, so I suppose I better introduce our guest first of all. Um, Jennifer Berger Coleman, JBC, as uh, if you're a follower of Grim Green, you will probably know her. Um, please, Jennifer, please, please don't get her confused with JCB. CJB, which is. Oh, yeah, and CJB as well. God, we've got too many permutations of those letters going around. <laughs> she's nothing like cjb nothing at all like cjb maybe i'll have to get a new name yeah maybe maybe it's time to change it maybe, you know maybe you just it's it's run its course now and it's time for something new um do you want to say hello and, and tell everyone who you are and what the hell you're doing on our show <laughs> hello everyone um, I'm Jennifer Berger Coleman. I'm I'm just me. Uh, I'm I'm. Uh, let's see. What am I? I'm the director of community outreach for CASA. Um, also, the newly elected, and I say that in quotation marks, um, vice president of the board as of last week. And that just means I have to make sure that the president is still breathing before the meetings. <laughs> so, just That's officially what they told me. <laughs> um, yeah. That's me. And we I am here because you graciously extended the invitation and um we made it work with my work schedule and I'm excited to be here. Yeah, not the easiest thing in the world when you're in California and uh and we're in old Blighty, but we've we've managed to make it work. We've We've used the uh, the daylight savings overlap period to our advantage because the time difference is a little bit smaller at the moment. So right, uh, seven hours instead of eight, right? Oh yeah, Marcus has just noticed how long my beard is. That's real nice. Risa, have you noticed how long my beard is? <laughs> uh, it's, it's an ongoing joke. I, I make a point every day of asking Risa if she's seen how long my beard's getting, and um, it's got to the point now where instead of saying, yeah, it's getting really long, she just sticks the finger up at me. So, um, yeah, Kassar, the Consumer Advocates for Smoke-Free Alternatives Association. Basically, you guys are the consumer side of advocacy and awareness in the USA, right? Fasata kind of handles the trade side and and you handle the consumer side is that how it breaks down 
Right. Yeah. Most most of the other advocacy orgs in the in the U.S. are trade organizations, whereas CASA is completely consumer based. So even though the bulk of our membership is vapors, it's not all vapors. It's people who use uh, um, like Swedish snooze, you know, smokeless tobacco, things like that. Right. We right. are. We are officially of the opinion that as long as there is less risk and you're not smoking, then that's what you should do if that's what works for you. Yeah, we're I mean, not just like, about the vaping, but I think mo most of the industry, like worldwide, is kind of unanimous that harm reduction is the goal. It's not. It's not about like addiction management. Some people seem to get really confused in, into sort of incorporating addiction management into it, and I think that is. A completely separate argument for a completely separate battle unless we're talking about icos unless we're talking about icos yeah icos we don't really agree with we're we're not we're not huge fans of that um but that's more because it's a lie not because it, it it's the, the issue isn't to do with harm reduction there because you know farsalinos reckons that the harm reduction is actually pretty convincing with icos it's more just the fact that it's a lie you can't say it's not smoking when it heats tobacco and then smoke comes out. <laughs> right. But it can be a good gateway for people who are looking to quit. You know, it, it yeah. took me way longer than it should have to, to just be a vapor. Yeah. And that's partially because, you know, the devices at the time weren't as good and whatnot, but, but partially because you know, you really want to mimic that smoking experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So we normally open up the show before we jump straight into the meat of the content with the, the hand checks thing. You've probably seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, so will you be scared if we ask you first what you're vaping on this week? No. Cool. I have a, I have a couple of things. I have the Squid Industries double barrel um, that one of the admins of the group custom made for me. He painted it purple. Um, Those with things the, are super, super cool. Yeah, with the reload RTA on here. I love this thing. Um, and that, that is filled with uh, Turkish maize, the M Turk juice, which is delicious. Kind of jealous. And, of yeah, it's really good. And then this is the, uh, what did we say? Mod defined prism, which is the offshoot of. Lost vape, yeah, um, much cheaper but still super solid. They just don't use the DNA chip in it, and that is filled with apple kiwi rounds, which is also delicious. Apple kiwi rounds. What is that like? Desserty, or is it just like a straight apple kiwi kind of thing? Or it's very fruity. There's no like hints of cream or right. anything. It's apple kiwi. So I always like to have one of each kind of going. I like more, one kind of savory one, and then I like one really fruity one. And I'll yeah. vape on one and get tired of one and go to the, you know. I've kind, kind of, of been thing. to doing the same sort of thing myself recently. I used to, like, I used to really, really hate anything that wasn't desserty, and I've kind of got into, into sort of using fruit stuff to balance dessert stuff in a big way recently. Mm-hmm. Was that uh, was that the triple RTA on top of that? Yes, the the Vandy Vape uh, Twisted 420. How are you getting on with that? I like it. I like it a lot, actually. I had, um, there's a guy, there's, oh, what are they called? Coyote Vapor Works. In the, the guys are in the Namber Juice group. And one of the guys, I messaged him and asked if he could build me coils that were small enough to you know to fit into a triple space but not come out at like 0.02 or whatever wouldn't fire on a mod yeah. and he did he did an amazing job so um yeah so i had to had to kind of wait till i got those coils but they're great so what's, what's that's what i was worried about is putting the coils in and you know if you put a set of m turks in there and then you put a third one in it's going to be way too low to even fire on a mod so what's the capacity on that tank over there um, I think it's five mLs. It's not as much as you think because the the barrel is so big. 
because it has to hold the triple coils. It right. looks like it would hold like 10, 10 mLs, but I think it's five. Then we should use thinner glass than us then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like it though, it's got really good flavor. So tradition dictates you've got to throw it over to someone else now. So uh, take your pick of, uh, of your favorite bearded person. Uh, well, I don't know about favorite, but okay, Stuart. <laughs> All right, all right. Yeah. No, I want to I mean, pick favorites. <laughs> I'd like to think I get the favorite slot anyway. You know, I mean, we've spoken a lot more. You know, I think I kind of earned that. So okay, you talk. okay you fair know. enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and besides, no one likes Mark. He's like, weren't you the least favorite host when we did the VT UK awards? No, Chandler was. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, third week running now. I think on the Wismec Luxotic. Um. And you know that you know that thing that vapors say like, oh, I really love it. I haven't put it down. Like mm -hmm. I literally really love it and haven't put it down. I I bought it on I think it was like a Wednesday, uh, three weeks ago, and I've used it every single day all day since then. And it's genuinely one of my favourite things that I've ever vaped. I just love it. It's so spot on um i'm still using the coil that it comes pre-built with it has a 0.2 ohm alien and they actually go to the trouble of pre-firing the coil and wicking it for you it's really heavily over wicked but the fact that they pre-fire it and the fact that they over uh, that they wick it for you um i thought that was really really neat so i decided to use it i, I wouldn't normally use included coils with a chinese atty because they tend to be pretty shit um mm -hmm. but it's actually been really good i've got a bunch of coils from um uh, run now actually because the presentation on them is so nice um i've got a load of coils from the coilologist he has just started commercial production with his coils now um so oh, nice. a new website up um i think it's the coilologist.co.uk um and obviously he's a member of team vulcan so you know, we kind of want to support him, and I want to vape his coils on everything, so that whenever anybody says, "Oh, those coils are nice," who's up they? I can be like, "Oh, well, they're actually my friend, the coilologists." But mm. the coil that comes with this is so good, I just don't want to take it out. Like, it's really, really nice, and I feel like I'm being a bit of a traitor. Um, but yeah, in that I've got Deja Voodoo from Wick Liquor, that um, coconut sugar cane, sweet as fuck, destroys your coils flavor mm. that they do. Um, and I've actually got that mixed at 6 mg. I'm, I'm trying to get my nicotine down from relying on 12 all the time. So I've kind of gone to lunging on 6 mg instead. Um, and it's it's pretty much doing doing the same kind of thing. Um, oh, quick one. Uh, Marcus in the chat says, stew, brackets, or reset, billet box update. Um, billet box <laughs> update. He's probably proud of this, isn't he? <laughs> uh, oh, no, this isn't the one that Craig's working on. Um, oh, yours. Yeah, okay. mine. So here is mine. Um, and Billet Box Vapor have agreed to take it back. Um, they have said that they will look at it. They will figure out what the problem is. And if the problem is their fault, they will cover the costs of fixing it. And they will cover my shipping to send it to them. Um, they better not say it's not their fault. <laughs> well, they, they've made absolutely no mention of what they'll do if it's not their fault. But <laughs> it, it. It, it turned up broke, so as far as I'm concerned, it's their fault. Um, you know, what, what are you going to do? Like, I've I've done everything. I've continuity tested it with uh, multimeter. I've checked all the contacts. I've tried different bridges. I've tried loosening it. I've tried tightening it. I've tried fucking putting it in a circle of salt and praying to Satan and nothing is bringing it to life. <laughs> um, so at this stage, it's going back to them and hopefully they're going to do something about it. Um, other hand check. I've got the Manhattan version two with the tactical warhead on top. Um, nice. Very kindly sold to me from Carlos, who used to be on the continuous current UK team. Um, was he the captain, Mark? He was, yeah. Yeah, um, 
he had that line around and was happy to let go of it. Um, it's the exact one that I used to have. I used to have a black Cerakote. Mine was actually brass originally, and this one is copper. But other than that, it's exactly what I used to have. Um, so I was super stoked to, to have that back in my life. Um, and courtesy of the lovely Bradley Pinto of Ideal Ohm Show slash Phobic Mods fame, um, I am vaping on Logic from Premise. And you can even see the flavor profile if my camera will focus. I don't even need to tell you what's in it because their branding is just so fucking nice. That is like some of Sounds my cool. Some of my favorite branding that I've ever seen, like each bottle comes in a little box like this. And it's just like real fucking nice grown up branding. You know, I've got so much time. for that. So, yeah, having a really good time with that. Um, milk, vanilla and honey. Three things that I really, really like. And um also the top three in my uh, list of stripper names if I ever have a change of career. So uh, my kind of vape. Um, Mark, what's thou vaping on, fam? Yes, blood. Right. I don't even know. I'm not, usually I'm more prepared. Um, this evening, I'm on Old Faithful. Where the fuck's Old Faithful gone? So a Nautilus 2 with toilet duck in it. No, I, I've not made toilet duck in six months. It's oh, yeah, it's um, ice menthol now, isn't it? No, just mint. Just mint. Just mint. Top of the ground mint. How is it? Minty. Good. Minty. Um, <sighs> my other hand, I've got my autumn mod. My autumn mod engraved... Squonker, which I got last week. Uh, I didn't I really... That's a recent pickup, isn't it? Yeah, not really had much of a play with it until this week. Um, cracking little mod. Got the Bomber, Bomber Tech Pro chip in it, so lots of flashing lights. Bit of a disco going on on a Thursday, uh, Tuesday night. Um, atop of that, I've got the one RDA. Oh, is this the um, the new thing from the guys that did Le Concorde? No, no, these are the guys. Um, I think they've got something to do with Vixet or or something like that. Okay. Um, I'm sure, I know Wally's with us tonight. I'm sure he'll um, interject if I'm wrong. Um, I've had a right fucking mare with this, I'll be honest. Oh, really? Um, it's a 100 quid RDA plus the postage, so... £108.25 or whatever it is. 67 mods of Vixet. Thank you, um, Ollie. I want to call him Doggo, man. Cheers, Ollie. Um, oh, 67 mods and Vixet. Nice. So it's a it's a list-only malarkey. Of course it is. Um, lucky, lucky enough to get one. 100 quid plus your shipping. So it came... It was an absolute fuck pig to get the cap off. <laughs> it was an absolute shit bag to find... The correct size Allen wrench to take the screws out. And then I must have put in seven, eight different builds. You know, I was close to the point of, and Ollie will tell you, of, you know what, fuck this, I've had enough. You know, um, um, you know I'll, I'll tinker like the best of us. But I was close to the point of throwing it at the wall sitting on you know what i'm like i don't sell anything it was going to sit on the shelf and never never be used again um persevered and i ended up with a five wrap 26 gauge fused 41 gauge and you know what it's a nice vape. it's a very restricted mouth to lung um don't know if you can make out the air holes oh that is a tiny little hole and it's nice. It suits yep. me. Suits me down to the ground. You know, I can sit and vape on the goon. I can sit and blow bear clouds, bro. But I like a good... Yeah, Rest restricted lung is definitely my kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I am really, really liking it now. Uh, in that, I have got four and a half milligram um, elderflower and apple from... 
restricted direct to lung. What did I say? Did I say restricted mouth to lung? Um, direct. No, I said, I said, make words, bro. Make words. Restricted lung. Um, <laughs> apple and elderflower from Jeffries. Oh, I've actually got a discount code to put on the group. Um, um, apple and elderflower, four and a half milligram on that. Um, I've also pulled out old, real old school. Um, I've got a bud tat. Oh, shit. Tugboat. I oh, would shit. not believe the shit I went through to get that. That's what that's got to be two, two and a half years old. And you know what? I don't know where the tugboat decking cap is, but it's got all, I, all I ever see of those is the fucking clones. Mm -hmm. yeah. ne never see the authentics around. Definitely no. Does it hit like a battery? It hits like a battery. It actually does it hit like a drunk battery? It's actually a quite a violent little Oh yeah, look at that. Um either way, and on that I am testing our final release of our rhubarb and ginger gin. Coming soon. The rhubarb and ginger gin. Rhubarb and ginger gin e liquid, yeah. Yeah. That's gonna be exciting. Are you actually using juniper in that? <laughs> well, does it taste of fucking juniper or not? I'm not asking you for an ingredient. No, not no, not massively on the juniper. Okay. Not massively. Um, the, there's the definite. You do get a juniper hit, obviously, from the gin, and then um, a good sour but sweet rhubarb mm. with a slight warmth of ginger and it's you know what the more i'm vaping ginger sorry i was reading the chat i was like what <laughs> mid-sentence <laughs> <laughs> just a look on your face as you tuned out then um yeah i'm really liking ginger do you know what that's kind of got me curious because i've never had a ginger vape that i got on with Ever and I really like the flavour of ginger. I'm a huge fan of ginger beer. A lot of a lot of the ginger stuff I use that you used to come across was always sweet ginger or a dessert ginger or a ginger bread or a ginger dessert. You didn't I've not come across many that are a ginger with fruit. Do you remember that Atty Boy one that had ginger in it? Yeah, tsunami. Yeah, I I I tried. I tried to like it. Like, I really... My problem, my problem with that was it had coconut in, and I don't do coconut. Just coconut like, and ginger? Yeah. Yeah. Ew. Too much. <laughs> I, I love coconut. Both the vapes that I'm vaping tonight are coconut-based. Let, let us not give any airtime to this said company. Oh, yeah, because we hate Rogue, don't we? There we go. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. We do hate Rogue. We do hate Rogue because they're scum. And we're allowed to say that. Because it's true. Yeah, and we can prove it. So it's fine. It's not slander <laughs> if it's true. <laughs> that's, that's the great thing about how the law works. You can only get into trouble for, say, for, for lying about a company and damaging their reputation. But the fact they're in another country as well, they probably couldn't afford to sue you anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Besides, they know I fucking am. They wouldn't want to sue me. <laughs> um, should we? Should we do a show? Should we? Should we have a go at doing a proper real vape show? Because we've got a we've got a real we've got a real serious guest that and, has Andrew, things to say Andrew, that are important. Andrew just said in chat, "I'm American and I can say it." <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, Andrew, you can say it. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like we should attempt to have like a proper Vape Talk UK tonight, actually talk about vaping in the UK and also in America, because that's kind of the point of what we want to do tonight. Um, so me and Mark both kind of separately come across some stuff recently, some like real good news advocacy stuff, um, which is sort of what got us thinking. 
Um, Mark, do you want to do your one first, or shall I do my one first? No, you go with yours first, because okay. mine's a bit of a... Okay, let me just find it. one at the minute. Um, so my one is I encountered... Uh, screen share, share this screen, share. I encountered this. Uh, this is from the Public Health Matters blog on the gov.uk website. Um, now, obviously, gov.uk website is our government's sort of portal. It's where they put stuff out for, for public information. Um, and so, obviously, this is, this is a from the horse's mouth outlet. This is the government's own blog written by their people. Um, and they published an article on the 20th of Feb called Clearing Up Some Myths Around E-Cigarettes. It's actually Mark Haynes, one of our regular viewers, that showed me this. So thank you, Mark, for sending it to me. Um, and it's quite blurby and blabbery, but basically what it's trying to do is disprove a lot of the common bullshit surrounding cigarettes. So we've got here myth one, e-cigarettes give you popcorn lung. We can blame bank tobacco for that myth. Um, yeah, and, and it explains here why that is bollocks. Uh, and it even says... Um, but uh, diacetyl is banned as an ingredient from e-cigarettes and e-liquids in the UK. It had been detected in some e-liquid flavorings in the past, but at levels hundreds of times lower than in cigarette smoke. Even at these levels, smoking is not a major risk factor um, for this rare disease. So that kind of goes back to the point that we were making about like diacetyl hadn't given anyone popcorn lung from cigarettes. So how was it going to do it in vaping? Um, and then we've got e-cigarettes aren't regulated and we don't know what's in them. Like how many times working in a vape shop does somebody say, oh, but you don't know what's in it, do you? Like, <laughs> yeah, I have been, yeah. To, to be fair though, Stu, that one's a bit of a, as much as I don't want to poo-poo this. <sighs> carry on, carry on, we'll come back to it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I know that that's a bit of a deeper point than, than it might appear because short fills, short fills are the X factor there. Um, anyway, e-cigarettes must be harmful as they contain nicotine. Uh, and it goes on to explain that nicotine isn't the, the scary part in a cigarette. Nicotine isn't the bit you need to worry about. Um, sorry, I'm just going to pull the chat up and move it to my other monitor so that I can see it while I'm uh, while I'm doing this. Um, then it's got the exposure to e-cigarette vapor is harmful to bystanders. So it's the, it's the whole passive vaping thing. And it explains why that is silly. Uh, e-cigarettes will lead young people into smoking. Um, and again, they're saying that there's absolutely no evidence to support that claim. Uh, e-cigarettes are being used as a Trojan horse. So the tobacco industry can keep people smoking. Obviously we know firsthand that the vast majority of the industry is small independent businesses um and that is a lot of what uh what is kind of about this um and it closes by saying in summary e-cigarettes and tobacco cigarettes are not the same and shouldn't be treated as such it is important that england's seven million smokers are aware of the differences and have accurate information to inform their health decisions E-cigarettes aren't completely risk-free, but carry a fraction of the risk of smoking and are helping thousands of smokers to quit and stay smoke-free. I love that little infographic above there. Go back. Oh, I can't now. I've, I've closed it. Hang on. I'll, I'll share I've lost it. it. I've, I've actually got it saved to my desktop that I liked it that much. Um. So that, that's something that we've got to be relatively proud of, hasn't it? In the UK now is the second highest smoking rate in Europe. Yeah, fifteen point eight percent. I re I remember going back. You know what? Go back to my school days, some um, <clears throat> ten years ago. Um, it was when invented when you were a kid. <laughs> some some ten years ago, and you you looked at the amount of kids, and I say kids because they weren't weren't sixteen. Um, Jennifer, what's the what's the smoking age in California? In California, it's twenty one. Twenty one. So, so school kids of fourteen, fifteen years old, which is when I started smoking, 
um, going out at lunchtime, going out on break times, having a cigarette. Um, and you go back and you remember sitting on the bus going into town and everyone upstairs was smoking. You go into a pub, everybody before the smoking ban, obviously, you go into a pub, everyone was smoking. And you, you look at the percentage back then, even just a guesstimate, you'd be looking at 40, 50% of people that appeared to smoke. Mm-hmm. To, have that, to have that reduced, and this is obviously a government statistic, so it's got to be taken with a pinch of salt. <laughs> 15.8%, even if they were massively out, you know, 20, 25%, that's some fucking good going. Yeah, that's some real progress. Some real progress. Um, and so this will kind of hint at why Jennifer's here now, because all of that information that our government is putting out and being very clear that they think the public should know this stuff. What is your government saying by contrast, Jennifer? <laughs> um, oh, where to start? Well, um, California is particularly, sorry, my dogs are freaking oh, out. That's okay. um, we, California between... is particularly, uh, what's the word, you know, we've, there have been a lot of flavor bans introduced recently um, all over California, Northern California, Southern California. The big one, of course, is coming in uh, June in San Francisco. That's sort of the one that everyone is watching because what happens in San Francisco will likely spread eastward toward the toward the East Coast, you know. Tell, um, tell, us, about, tell us about that. What, what, what are they bringing in? What flavor uh, bans? So the the uh, San Francisco Board of Supervisors vo- voted to uh, to ban flavors entirely, including menthol cigarettes, and they're doing it. Um, you know, of course, the children are are the big focus of it, but they're also doing it. They're bringing in groups, uh, you know, saying that it's it's harmful to LGBTQ people. It's harmful to the black community that all of these ads have always targeted, you know, that it's like 80 percent of of the black community smokes uh, menthol cigarettes. And so we should ban menthol cigarettes as well as all flavors. Um, so they did that. They they introduced it. Um, a few of us went to the hearing and you know kind of spoke against it. But they they packed the uh, the room with you know the the children and the the school teachers and whatnot holding signs and you know please please save the children and um, so they voted they voted to pass it and it passed. But then. Um, do you guys know who Stefan Didak is? He's uh, he's the founder and CEO of Not Blowing Smoke. We're, yeah. we're not super familiar with him over here because Not Blowing Smoke is really very much a US thing. Right, yeah. So he's um, he lives not too far away from me, about an hour away from me. And um, he really has the he gets all the information about the California stuff seemingly before anyone else. And so he partnered, um, there's a law firm and, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of big money coming into it. Um, the Arab American grocers association in San Francisco and, and some other people. And of course, Kassad signed off on it. And so what they did was they got in San Francisco, you can get what's called a referendum on the ballot, which then stops whatever law they enacted in in its tracks until it goes to the ballot to the voters. And what the requirement was, was that they had to get 10% of the signatures of the voters who had voted in the last election. So they did that by, I mean, they got, I don't know, like 100,000 more signatures than they needed, way more than they needed and put it on the ballot. And so um, so what's happening now is, of course, last week we just got the ballot designation. So prior to this, we didn't know anything about what it was gonna be called. Like we could say vote no on the flavor ban, but we didn't know what it was gonna be called. And now we know it's Proposition E. And so there's gonna be a really big um, media campaign. They've been doing a lot of um, 
focus groups about what messaging works with people in San Francisco, you know, and of course it depends on on what uh, group you're you're talking to. But um, so it's it's very promising. I mean, it's the most promising thing that we have. And uh, so, so proposition to me, who's got who? How's this going to be led? Is this going to be led by advocacy groups? Is this going to be led by um, health professionals? How 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 is this likely to be led? So it's a it's a coalition. It's the coalition itself is called Let's Be Real San Francisco, um, but it's being led by the leader of it is that actually works for a law firm, but there's a whole, I, they have over a thousand organizations on board now, um, including, well, we're working on a couple right now that could be really big as far as, um, as far as the LGBTQ community, um, because most of the harm reduction places there in San Francisco are completely unaware of what the measure means, as are most voters. They, you know, they just see, oh, you know, poison and candy and children, and, and that's sort of as far as they go. And so um, there's there's a man who lives in New York City, actually, that used to live in San Francisco that has been flying back and forth and talking to uh, um, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, as well as a few other of the big ones and, and telling them the impact that this really has. You know, they're talking about, well, it's, tar you know, their ads target the, the gay community and it targets the black community and whatnot. But he goes in there with real numbers and he says, look, people with HIV need to quit smoking. They need to switch to vaping you know, and, and these are the consequences. And, you know, this many people, I think it's 12,000 people a year now die of AIDS related illnesses, which is down hugely from, you know, the early nineties or so where it was like 50 something thousand people a year. However, more than 30,000 LGBTQ people alone die of smoking related illnesses still. And we're still pushing this message of, you just need to stop smoking. You know, we're not pushing the harm reduction message. And in San Francisco, that's completely ridiculous because they were the ones at the forefront of harm reduction when when the whole AIDS crisis hit. They were the ones that that championed the the needle exchanges and the free condoms and the you know. So um, so that's a really big part of it and and like i said we just got the ballot designation last week and so now we can go ahead with the uh with the media campaign we've ju we've just had andrew um in the chat say lgbtq really that's less than one percent of the population but that's who they're targeting and that's not less than one percent of the population really in not, especially not in san francisco yeah <laughs> yeah um they target you know of course of course they target the children and that's what works on a lot of people but in san francisco you have to remember it's a um it's a very different set of circumstances whereas it's up to 10 percent of the population some some say around maybe even 13 percent of the population is in the lgbtq community and then as well they're targeting the black community and you know bringing them in and saying well menthol you know they get hooked on menthol cigarettes and we need to ban that and blah 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 and so i know that we have had some talks with the president of the naacp there in san francisco who is also not on board with the flavor ban so you know in san francisco you have to get you have to kind of beat them at their own game which is that they're going to drag all the people who um, basically run San Francisco, which are, you know, all these groups of people, the, the Chinese community, et cetera, et cetera. You have to kind of get them into the fold because that's what they're doing. So. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty stark contrast, isn't it? It's a pretty. It, it, it's almost hard to believe how different the situation would be like if you consult the rest of the world ignoring the uk and america 
the British and the Americans are often seen as seeing very eye to eye, especially at a governmental level on most issues. You know, um, right. and that's where the term the special relationship comes from. That you know, the UK and America have always kind of been teammates when it comes to global politics. Um, and domestic policies in the UK and America are usually very, very similar. We usually have very similar ways of doing stuff, very similar ways of approaching problems. Um, and tobacco control is something that both the UK and America are taking very, very seriously at the moment. So you have to ask yourself the question, why is America ignoring facts and putting people in harm's way as a result? Um, why are they twisting the truth and creating an environment where people are not only going to lose access to life-saving vapor products, but are also less likely to actually try to find out about those products? You see, for me, I, I, <clears throat> obviously I don't know um, the American way as well as as well as as well as Jennifer does, but from an outsider looking in, to me, one, it looks like tax dollars. Mm -hmm. That's that's from from what I've seen on documentaries, from what I've heard, you know, it's tax dollars, but also it's the kickback from big tobacco that they give to the government. Well I'd be completely wrong, but that would be my guess. There is um there is subsidy for tobacco companies, isn't there? And, you know, what what by any other name would be called tax avoidance schemes, but, you know, with, when it's big tobacco, they are, um, what, what do they call them? Pledges or the, the big tobacco companies basically? Donations. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and, and this, this is where it gets difficult because as a non-American, it's very easy to look at the American medical situation um, and say that that is absolutely corrupt. It's very easy to look at big agriculture and including in that tobacco growing, which is, is part of big agriculture, um, and say that that system is absolutely corrupt. And how do you... How do you, as an American, tackle that? You know, you're, you're, you've got to live with it. Like... How, how do you how do you explain to people that cultural norms over there are trying to kill the population well so here's the thing um while big tobacco is certainly no friend of ours um they also very often especially nowadays um have the same interest as us so where things like flavor bands come in and they want to ban menthol and you know big tobacco knows where the market's going they want to get into the vape game as well and they're doing things like icos and whatnot they know where the markets are going um so while while they are certainly not not our best friend um i think more dangerous and more uh problematic is the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. and you know um there was a really great video i watched it was about a 20 minute long video a couple years ago and matt cully from suck my mod had done um drawing the he called it the triangle of fuckery <laughs> and it was um it was it was talking about um you know the fda now obviously we have we have a new head we have dr gottlieb who is who is decidedly more level-headed than the last one was um there are still some problems there but but he's 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 more in tune um but the the former head of the fda prior to that was married to a pharmaceutical rep and then you know, when you get these big coalitions of groups like we have here that write to the FDA and they say, no, no, you know, flavors are getting children hooked, blah, blah, blah. And always at the head of that, aside from the American Lung Association and all the other body parts are the, um, the campaign for tobacco free kids. And if you look at where their grant money comes from, it comes from Johnson and Johnson who make, you know, Nicorette, 
nicoderm, et cetera, et cetera. And so really they're the problematic ones. It's the ones who have their hands really deeply embedded in, in all, you know, you think, oh, the tobacco campaign for tobacco free kids. That sounds like an amazing thing. No one wants kids to smoke. And they're, they're really shitty. The Matt Myers is, I'm allowed to swear on here, right? Yeah, he's a fucking fun. asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Myers sucks, and um, he's the one who runs the campaign for tobacco-free kids. And you know, like I said, people listen to that because they say, "Oh yeah, kids, you don't want kids to smoke." Well, yeah, cool. Um, and and they are funded by Johnson and Johnson, and so that's where it gets really problematic. Is that? Um, and then of course the medical industry you know, the doctors get paid to push, you know, you see this thing about we're having this whole opioid crisis right now because the pharmaceutical reps come in there and they say, you know, we'll give you all these kickbacks if you put all these people on pain meds. Same thing with with all the other drug companies and the pharmaceutical companies. And so I think that's where it's really problematic. Um, along with parts of big tobacco but like I, mean, I said they're they're less and less it, it has to be said um a lot of a lot of the damage that was done here when the tobacco related products regulations were finalized um it would be very easy to park that at the feet of a big farmer um and honestly when you look at big tobacco and, and what they're doing, they actually do have a lot of the same interests as us. And I think that is a battle to come. I think at the point that they start trying to muscle us out of our own industry, that's going to be a battle to come. But I think mm -hmm. they have to they have to dig the trenches first. And that involves, you know, before before that battle can happen, they have to create an environment where they know that if they put their money into vaping, it's secure. You know, what, what they want to know is that there are long term avenues for profit, as there have been with cigarettes. And so first, they need to see vapor products not under the spotlight. And they, they need to see vapor products as a as a government approved alternative to, to smoking that, that promotes harm reduction. Um, and, and I think you actually touch on something that we that's really easy for us to overlook here, um, because it, it is the pharmaceutical companies that right now are doing the damage because they're the ones that right now are going to go out of business. Tobacco companies can grow tobacco, extract nicotine from it and put it into a vape and still make their money. Their business model can still work. Absolutely. But pharmaceutical companies, they buy their nicotine from tobacco companies. And if the, to and, and if, if the tobacco companies say, we're making vapes now, we don't need to sell you money for, for patches. You know, we don't need to sell you money to make nicotine patches uh, or we, we need to sell you tobacco to make nicotine patches anymore you see on the opposite side of that Stu, i think um obviously the the u.s health service and and the uk health service are very very different obviously we've got our national health service everything over there is am i right in saying everything over there is privatized in some way pretty much yeah pretty much so obviously for us it's a uh, it's our tax that pays for our pays for our medical care and obviously our government want to cut obviously the cost of cancer obviously the cost of all other smoking related diseases you know comes out of our out of the the government's coffers at the end of the day in the money that's given to the national health service to pay for the care and the treatment that we give obviously in america it's all funded by insurance, you know. All these, mm -hmm. all these, all these. Um, again, big pharma. Uh, they're they're sitting there and they're producing all these cancer curing um, medicines and treating people for cancer. If we if we can cure cancer, why why, why you're going to make hell of a lot more money treating it than you are curing it? Surely. So, so part of my my twisted bitter mind, I, I should say, um, you know, with big with big pharma, to me, it screams, you know, what we want people to be ill. We want people yeah. to 
to to I hate to say this, we want people to suffer because of course they do. It's an industry built around people that are sick. You know, whether it's Absolutely. insurance companies, whether it's is whether it's big pharma, whoever, they're making billions and billions of dollars a year. Whereas in the UK, we're losing billions and billions of pounds a year. It's mm -hmm. very, very different things. So I think our government perhaps looks at it in a slightly different way. You know what? 15% instead of 40% of them are smoking. You know what? Right now, we're losing money because we're not getting the tax revenue from cigarettes. But long term, in 10, 20, 30, 40 years in the future, when smoking-related diseases are not gone, but are a lot less than they are today, we're going to be saving money. Whereas the US, they need to make the money. They need for these. And I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. And I think I think that is, if there was any one reason for the difference between the UK policy and the US policy, it is the National Health Service. Because every sick person here costs the government money. Whereas every sick person in America earns the government money absolutely grim green always talks about that he said he says i think that's the difference is that in the uk your interests the public's interests are best served by saving the healthcare system money um because it's a publicly funded um you know medical care system whereas here it's completely the opposite and you know they know that big pharma <laughs> What are the, I think the, the, the success rates of um, patches and lozenges and all that shit combined is somewhere around 8%, maybe 10% tops, yeah. but it's usually around 8%. They know that their shitty products don't work, but that's okay because then you're going to get cancer and then they get to treat your cancer, you know? And so they profit on it on both ends they're like great if you buy our products we know it doesn't work very well so you know then we're going to sell you a bunch of drugs that are going to treat your cancer um yeah and that's why our our that's exactly why we're in the predicament we're in now and you guys are are worlds ahead of us uh, as an advocate how does that make you feel what's that as an advocate how does that make you feel Oh God, it's frustrating. It's the thing that keeps me up at night <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it's Sorry. really frustrating. Yeah. Sorry. I the messaging I here is so much different than, than it is there. You know, I'll come across, I would say most of 90% of, of the people who are on my, my Facebook and certainly my Instagram are, are vapors and are like-minded people. But then, you know, I have my family members or people I went to high school with or whatever, and I'll come across that crap all the time. Like vaping is worse for you than smoking and the kids are dying. And, you know, the messaging here is so much different. I mean, I argue, I, I get in an argument probably once a day on social media with someone who's not a vapor. <laughs> um, Sean, it is Sean. Sean from Golden Vapor, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Sean, yeah. Um, Sean put a message in the group earlier. I just think it's perfect time to um, pose this question. Um, how do we target smokers and give them the correct and impartial advice regarding vaping? Now, I know how we do it over here. Um, how, how do you guys do it? Well, that's the thing. Um, the FDA, as it stands right now, says that we can't make modified risk claims. So we can say things like, well, I can say things because I'm part of a consumer group and I can kind of say a lot of things that a lot of the manufacturers can't say. I can say the Royal College of Physicians, who are the smartest group of people in the world, <laughs> say that vaping is at least 95% less harmful for you. But e-liquid manufacturers and people who run shops and whatnot cannot say that there are any modified risk claims at all that it's healthier for you that that it you know they can't make any of those claims and so that's why it's really hard to target are they, smokers are they allowed to quote evidence or is that classed as a making a modified risk claim <sighs> i 
Yes, I think I think like I said, they're allowed to say the Royal College of Physicians says this or whatever, you know, study says this. But yeah, they're allowed to quote evidence. Because because to me that would be that would be where you get around it and how you get around it is is the very clever and consistent and constant use of quotations of people that are allowed to make modified risk claims. Mm -hmm. um, that to me would be the, the, the secret. Um, so we've kind of, we've spoken quite a bit about um, the a, a sort of personal level um, you know, how it, how it affects the average citizen. Um, but at a governmental level, at a policy level, there's also a lot of disparity between the UK and the US. Um, so this, this leads into the article that Mark found, which is to do with regulatory policy in the UK and some proposed changes. Um, Mark, do you want to explain to us exactly what this article is? Yeah, obviously, last April we had the TRPR kick in. Um, they took away um, our, toys. our toys, a lot of our rights. You know, we, we've we've had it relatively easy compared to what the guys in the States are going through. Um, but obviously they took away, you know, the, the unlimited size of tanks that we could have, you know, two mils is that all that's all we've got um e-liquid um that has nicotine can't be sold in any larger vessels than 10 mil um they took away our rights for advertising they took away hell of a lot of stuff that we can well that we can't do period um and there has been this week a lot of talk um from a bill that's being put forward to Parliament, um, and if you give me a second, I've actually lost my paperwork. Um, <laughs> typical. Um, basically, like they're, they're, organized, they're, is it? they're they're putting putting in in front of Parliament that they want to de deregulate um, electronic cigarettes. Um, they want to revoke Section Six, which is the full electronic cigarette section of the TRPR. Obviously, anything else that's combustible or chewable or whatever will still maintain. Um, they, um, bear with me. Um, they, they, they want to get rid of um, the size and the capacity contents. They want to change um, provision on the um, packaging and also the retail uh, the refill containers um, now obviously it's probably not ever gonna happen you know but but it's been mm. dragged up it's been it's been bought up it's been heavily publicized this week last week um, by social media media and you know there was a lot of hype you know there was a lot of people saying, oh, that's the TPD gone, that's the TRPR gone. You know, welcome back. We can have five mil tanks again. I can now buy 18 milligram in 60 mils. It's probably not going to happen, you know, but it's a it's a positive way forward for us. The, the fact that... Like you, like you said the other day, um, Mark, was that you said at, at least, at the very least... It is getting these ideas talked about in Parliament. It is getting spoken about. It's getting... Hi, uh, it, you all right? Mm. Uh, hello? Um, yes. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, getting, it's getting it spoken about. It, it's at least getting it out there that, uh, that it's being seen in a more positive light and that these studies are... The interesting, thing, the interesting thing about this is that this article became public knowledge when no one in the industry was talking about it. No one in the industry pushed for it to happen. It wasn't generated from within the industry. There were no, no. campaigns. 
most of the vape media outlets haven't covered advocacy in fucking months, us included, you know? Advocacy has really been on the back burner in the UK, and that's something I want to maybe talk a little bit more about later in the show. Um, but this came from within Parliament. This, this started within Parliament, grew within Parliament, and got big enough that it became something that the public then said, oh, have you seen what's going on in Parliament? Mm -hmm. And started sharing about social media. When it was when it was the Lord's vote back in the TPD, that started with us. We put that about. We generated that. No one in Parliament was talking about vaping back then until the TRPR came together. And we said, hang on, you've got this all a bit wrong. We want our say. What that tells us is that there's been a paradigm shift at the center of Parliament. People in Parliament are talking about vaping internally within the institution. That is a radical change since last April. It is an absolutely massive change since last April. And what it means is that vaping is now something that they understand plays a role in public health and needs to be discussed. I think Jimmy's, Jimmy's hit the nail on the head in the chat. I mean, cancer research has had a lot to do with the, the promotion of, of vaping being a safer alternative. Um, yeah, so. I saw that you, I believe it was in the UK that they were, someone even proposed, maybe it was the Public Health UK, that um, to allow vaping in private hospital rooms and to allow the sales of e-cigarettes of e in, in hospital stores. Mm -hmm. for people who are confined to the hospital that was the national health service wasn't it that's, yeah. like that's amazing that would never happen here <laughs> <laughs> to be fair i can't see it happening could you imagine someone with a with a you know a nice a nice sub tank or a or, or a dripper <laughs> in, a, in a tiny little uh, tiny little room clap and i can't see it happening myself but it, it, like you say it, it is the fact that that's come up, yeah, the that that conversation has happened can only be positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How many people need a porter to wheel them down outstairs so they can go and smoke their Benson hedges or their Marlboro or, or whatever? You know, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing offensive by what's produced from a little von Earl, a small mouth to lung, high nicotine. The gets rid of those urges you can stick a patch i don't know i don't know you ask you ask Risa if there's anything offensive about uh what this puts out that is the smell to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah the stock flavors in it are a little bit sweaty socks aren't they? What, what are your thoughts on the uh, caramel bourbon flavor from blue oh, it smells like it smells like what i imagine that old man's asshole tastes like <laughs> <laughs> you have beautiful way with words and for many reasons. <laughs> can I can I just say but that's okay because yeah. hospitals already smell like that anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> fortunately, it does actually vape. When you vape it, it does taste a little bit better. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. I actually I think the uh, tobacco creme is actually genuinely really nice. I actually think it's a very good, very nice flavour. <laughs> <laughs> So, again, just going back to the counterpoint. When the government in America talk about vaping, who starts the conversation? Um, politicians, usually. Um, so... This is where it gets super frustrating. Um, the people who introduced flavor bans, like in San Francisco or in you know Southern California and Los Angeles and San Diego and all these places that and all around the Bay Area where flavor bans are being introduced, are typically what you would call um, liberal governments or bodies of bodies of politicians where it's the people who do advocate for needle exchanges for christ's sake they're opening up um 
you know, safe injection places in San Francisco. Yeah, so, yeah. so people, you know, which I'm, that's, that's great. I'm all for sure. like, go, you know, don't pass around dirty needles and infect other people. And, and that's all great. But for Christ's sake, how can you talk about <laughs> banning everything but tobacco basically? And, you know, you're opening up like heroin injection centers and, um, you know, and and marijuana is legal. There's there's all sorts of places you can go buy it and smoke it, and you know, so so it doesn't mesh. Like the two, those things don't don't correlate with each other, and and it's really frustrating to have a conversation with them. Like, how can you be so progressive in so many ways and leading the fight in in all these things and uh, you know harm reduction and then with e-cigarettes you are just so closed off i mean literally in san francisco basically all that will be legal is tobacco cigarettes like you can walk into any store and buy a pack of Marlboros, but like, not a blue or a jewel or whatever yeah. There, there is absolutely no way you can cut that where it makes sense. Like, the one thing that we absolutely know is the worst of the bunch is the thing that is FDA approved, essentially. Right. And their argument is always, but the children, the children are getting hooked. But what about the adults who are already hooked, who need help quitting? You know, <laughs> that's where they're forgetting. <laughs> And they don't Andrew care about that. Has, um, Andrew in the chat has just come up with a very elegant solution to the problem. He says you should move out of California, then push it into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> with the exception of some of the regulatory processes in California, it's actually a very nice place to live. Yeah. The weather's great. It's beautiful. The people are, are pretty chill and cool. But yeah, yes, it's it's very frustrating. It's not, it's not a great situation. I think like the takeaway for me is that, and, and I've actually, I've said this before, like we've got it really good over here. Um, and I think, you know, for all of our whinging about two mil tanks and whinging about Nick shots and we've got it so easy in comparison to other people. People are literally on the verge of losing all access to products that save their lives. Um, it's fucking bonkers that we were so bothered. Like we had so much moaning to do when the TPD was being put together, and now that we've had it so easy for you know for a year that we kind of just don't seem to care now. Um, and that really bothers me because we could be helping out with the fight in other countries. You know, we we could be helping out in America, we could be helping out in Australia where they've got it terribly, we could be helping out in Malaysia where they've got it terribly, we could be helping out in Italy closer to home where they've got it really bad. I don't, I don't, I don't know what you think, I think, I think the biggest way that we can help is, is, to, is, is to continue with what we're doing. We, we've, got, we've got like cancer research on our side, uh, we've got the um, Royal Association, the yeah, physicians on our side, and we need to continue to push that and and show that you can have more relaxed uh, regulations on e-cigarettes and and they work. I think I think it's only going to get better. The evidence that that is going to come out of uh, but the, but places that have, how do you frame that for the global stage? That that's the question to me, and that's really the, my question to Jennifer. How do you how do you frame the user experience in the UK and the progressiveness and the, the positive outcome that we've had? How do you frame that and pass it on internationally? How do you how do you use that to make a positive change in areas where it's a lot worse? What what can we do? That's a good question. I, I suppose it would depend on on where you're talking about. You know, with the UK, it seems like everyone sees how obvious it is 
the benefits of, of e-cigarettes. Um, Mark, you said that the, the smoking rate's down to 15% now. Well, of course, that's attributable to e-cigarettes. But when we talk about that here, when we say, okay, the smoking numbers are the lowest they've ever been. I think yesterday they said somewhere, I saw an article somewhere around 14% here in the U.S., lowest they've ever been. But what happens here is they say, well, that's because of all the regulations and all the taxes that we're putting on them. We're making it, you know, and so it's just such a different conversation depending on where you, I don't know. I, I think the people in the UK are, the government obviously is way smarter, um, <laughs> you know, that they see logic. And so it's hard to fight people who are not using logic and it's hard to get through to people who are not using logic but yes if you can you know i don't know if you can permeate different groups of vapors um vaping groups social media is a huge tool you know um that if you can really get that word out about what's going on in the uk and then it spreads I mean, that's the only way things get done here in the United States is if people show up to protest in mass, you know, and the vapors are here are just so worn out and beat down. And it's really hard to get people motivated to show up at things, um, especially here in California. They feel like, well, it's just kind of a losing battle. Right. But that's the only way you get things done, you know. Here's an interesting statistic for you. Uh, so vaping has, we all agree, kind of been on the rise since about 2008. We're getting towards about a being about a 10-year-old industry now. Um, and we would all agree that probably around 2012 to 2013 is where vaping really started to show up in the spotlight. Uh, we all, we're all pretty happy as people from various corners of the industry to yep. go with those numbers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the highest recorded year in the last, where does my graph start? In the last 17 years, the highest recorded year of tobacco duty receipts in the UK was 2013. So taxation definitely does not correlate with a reduction in the smoking rate. Mm -hmm. If the UK took more tax than it had ever taken before in the 2012 to 2013 fiscal year on tobacco. If the UK, if the UK charged more tax in that year than it ever had since 2000, there is absolutely no correlation between e-cigarettes, uh, sorry, between taxation and smoking decline. Because I can tell you now that in 2012 to 2013, that 15% figure was a fucking lot higher. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I isn't, that, isn't that half to isn't isn't that half to do with the fact that um, a packet of cigarettes is like you know three four pounds? I mean, it was a fiver when I last bought a packet of cigarettes. It cost me a fiver for a packet of twenty. Um, now you're doing well if you can get a packet of cigarettes for under a tenner. You also mm -hmm. can't get 20s anymore, apparently. No, you can, can't you? It's no, 10s you can't get. It's only 10s you can't get. You can get 20s. You no, only get apparently 20s. big packets are like 18s now or something to make them no. a bit cheaper. Everyone's doing 18s instead. No, they used to do that, but the TPD, they, they were doing that, but the TPD regulations forced them to sell them in packs of 20. Right, okay. So you can now only buy packs of 20. Not my chair, Andrew. My chair squeak free. Reese's chair squeaks, though. You might be hearing that. <laughs> Jennifer, Jennifer, how, how do you think it would go down? Do you know if um, the US was to adopt UK ruling, so you could only buy <clears throat> nicotine e-liquid in 10 mil bottles and you'd have to nick shot your juices. You could only have two millimeter, two millimeter tanks, milliliter tanks as a maximum. How, how would that go down? with your guys well i mean probably like it did with you guys at first i mean because those are stupid arbitrary rules um let's be honest but you know like you've said you you guys have it so much better than us i mean those things are are minor inconveniences as opposed to 
a whole industry being completely wiped out. Um, you know, I, that would certainly be preferable to what we are potentially facing. Um, like I said earlier, the, the, the new head of the FDA, Dr. Gottlieb, certainly has a lot more sense than the old one did. Mitch Zeller was just a dickhead. He, you know, and he, he very much was, was intertwined in that pharmaceutical stuff too. Um, Mitch Zeller at least has spoken the words harm reduction and e-cigarettes in the same sentences. And, you know, today the, um, he, there's a letter that he wrote that you can find on the FDA page. You can find it. It was circulating, circulating around a lot today, um, where he's talking about that, that the main concern is, is not having youth initiate a kind of tobacco use, including e-cigarettes, and that they need to take a very hard look at, at how flavors play into that. But he also recognizes that that flavors are an important tool for adult smokers, smokers who are already addicted. Um, but still, you know, the possibility is there. The possibility is very real that, that we may be relegated to tobacco only, you know, no characterizing flavors. So not even like a tobacco cream or a tobacco almond or, you know, tobacco mint, um, which is kind of horrifying because I don't want to taste tobacco anymore. Would that, um, would, that, would, that, would that apply to tobacco itself as well? Just the way back when I smoked, I used to smoke vanilla, uh, vanilla flavored rolling tobacco. It already does apply to cigarettes here. Um, you can, for the time being, you can only have tobacco and menthol flavored tobacco. They're also targeting the, um, you know, the little cigarello things that they yeah. they roll <laughs> blunts in um, because those come in all kinds of, you know, cherry, grape, you name it, you can get those. Yeah. So they're targeting those. Um, I, remember so, having a, yeah. I remember having an amaretto flavored uh, cigar when I was in Vegas. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah, <you> <laughs> so we'll see. I don't know. It's it's pretty it's pretty scary. And right now, it, I mean, literally within the next couple of days, we're waiting to see if the Cole Bishop Amendment passes, which is in front of uh, Congress right now which only serves to take the deeming regulation date because right now mm -hmm. speaking of stupid and arbit arbitrary it, it goes back to 2007 so so going up to now if anything if your product wasn't on the market before 2007 which no one was then you're not going to be allowed to sell it yeah. past 2022 now but if the Cole Bishop Amendment passes, then it takes it up to August 8th of 2016. And it's really dumb how they do it here because it's actually a rider on an agricultural bill. So if they can get that agricultural bill through and, and the Cole Bishop Amendment is attached to it, that's our best hope. So we'll oh see. We, we will know literally by Friday. Okay. Do you, do you have any, do you have any idea? Um, um, what the likely outcome is, or is it purely a sit and hope and wait and see? Um, our hopes are better around this time um, than it was last year when it was going through. Um, the, I think the things that they want to pass through, and it's a very, um, Republican controlled Congress for the time being, which in, in this situation is a good thing because they want less regulations. They want to be able to show that they're rolling back the regulations. So I, you know, it's about 50, 50 where, which is a lot better than it was last year at this time. So, yeah. but that still doesn't change the fact that then nothing new can come out onto the market. Um, you know, I mean, so I mean, anything post, 2016 august 8th um there was also another article today another big news article about that there the fda just put out 25 million dollars in contracts to private contractors 
to go out now and start checking shops and checking what's on the shelf and checking if people are compliant. And if you're having stuff that's made post 2016, you know, they're going to get confiscated. They're going to fine you. So is that, so is that hardware and juice or everything? There are, and that also applies to the shops now. If you have to register as a tobacco manufacturer, if your shop is going to make and install coils for people. So if someone walks into your shop and says, hey, can you install these coils in my atomizer? I'm new or whatever. You know, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So not if you're not registered as a tobacco manufacturer. Dale has just asked in the chat, and I think <laughs> I, I was going to kind of touch on this as well. Um, he says, is that for USA made products only or would all European imports be discounted from that or would they have to be pre-2016 also? So basically there is a kind of workaround, isn't there, where you can import stuff um, that wasn't on the market and that um, that's kind of treated as a separate thing, isn't it? So that's kind of how, for example, the, the Rage Squonker that's about to come out from Ownboy, like... Homeboy is the designer, but the company that exports that to America isn't an American company. And that is how, you know, Homeboy effectively gets royalties on the design, I imagine, um, as opposed to him actually being the person that sells it. And that's how it's kind of legal for him to to release a product, even though it's gone past the date. So, so there are workarounds that are being used, but obviously the problem with workarounds is that eventually that that loop can be closed can't it mm -hmm. well i think yeah i think that's oh chandler was just about to make a point and then his internet potato uh -oh. now uh-oh yeah <laughs> you're kind of back, I'm, back. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of back i i was gonna say that's the biggest workaround that we've got over here is the short fills short yeah. fills did not exist pre-tpd the uh, zero milligram short fills that you have to add an 18 milligram dick shot to um, and it never would have been thought of uh pre no. you know it never would have been deemed worthwhile to do that as in what's the point but yeah uh, sure. yeah but it, again it is interesting because it's entirely possible that america could adopt that model you know if if they do flavor bands then you have your flavors and your vegetable glycerol and, and your propylene glycol with no nicotine and that's not a tobacco product it's not covered and then you add a nick shot to it to make it into e-liquid you know because that right i mean i'm sure that's that's probably what would end up happening there there's already sites where you can buy the um the one shots the flavor shots so it's basically a complete flavor profile, you know, mixed for you and you just add it to whatever, you know, propylene glycol or, or vegetable glycerin and nicotine content that you want. Um, exactly. And and yeah, they can't they can't ban food flavorings. So now, the interesting thing about this is um, as we have as we have said over here, that kind of opens up an avenue for it, it makes it easier to put worse quality products on the market because what's what's happened in the UK since Nick shots have become commonplace is now everyone owns a juice line. Every Tom, Dick and Harry owns a juice line and it all, you know, and in a lot of cases it can be very poor quality liquid made with whatever they like, wherever they like, however they like. And the only thing that is regulated is that 10 mil Nick shot, which they can buy from another company and use their 10 mil nick shot that has been tested. Um, and, and so a lot of the argument at the moment about the 10 mil short fills over here is it's, it actually creates an environment where it's easier to put out a lower quality product than it would be under just regulation where the regulations made sense. Because there is a limit to the reach of the government and industrious people will find ways to work around that limit, you know. Well, and yeah, think about, I mean, applying it there and here, um, you know, if if it comes to where that people are having to just buy, you know, their jugs of PG and their jugs of VG and their, their jugs of nicotine and then they're just buying the flavor shots, think about a brand new vapor 
trying to do this, you know, dealing with 100 milligrams of nicotine and trying to mix that. And, and then you, you've got a whole other problem on your hands. I mean, when I was brand new, I wouldn't have known. I would have been like, sure, like 50 ml of 100 milligram nicotine, you know, in a 30 ml bottle or, you know, it, it presents a lot of problems when you force people to kind of do those workarounds. It makes it a lot more unsafe. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's that's part of the issue, because unfortunately, when they when they design a regulatory framework, it has to make sense or it can't be followed in, ter in terms of it, it has to be something that it is possible to follow. Um, and when you regulate e-liquid, you can't regulate the constituent components of e-liquid. And as long as as long as one of those parts falls into your regulatory framework, you 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 know you leave the door open for this to happen and i think this is this is a conversation that a lot of governments have to have with themselves is are we actually so are we are we being so draconian in our in our regulatory method that we're actually creating a worse environment than the one that we're trying to protect people from mm -hmm. cuz i kind of feel like i could see it going that way in the states you know mm -hmm. if, if they say, oh, e-liquid is fine as long as it's flavorless or tobacco flavored, then people will just release yes. 18 milligram flavorless and you'll get your flavor base and your VG and your PG. And that's what your vape stocks will shop. They'll stock flavor base, VG, PG and 10 mil nick shots. And you'll mix mm -hmm. it at home. You know, and, and, and you'll still you'll still have there'll be there'll be a lot of there'll be a lot of shops branching out into um, coffee flavors. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the way it'll go. You know? It's yep. it's absolutely bonkers. Um and and I do hope that um that something can be done to stop it. So I do I do agree with what Sean's just said. It would make good sense to regulate short fills as well as as well to eliminate bathtub juice companies and allow genuine companies to continue. Now <clears throat> I'm not going to mention names, but there's a lot of chaff on the market. There is a lot of shitty liquid on the market. And there's stuff that are... the stuff that is not, not, not tested, not tested in any way, shape, or form. Um, as Dale's just said... We... we Something needs to be tested, you know, whether it's tox testing somewhere along the line. I'm not saying go, going through TPR, TPD uh, registration, going through with the MHRA, but it needs to be tested in some way. You know, there's a lot of cunts on this mar in this market that are in it purely for the cash. Yep. And they're releasing line after line after line in who knows what conditions. Now, I know of be careful what i say a number <laughs> of e-liquid ranges that have been released recently that have been openly said it's been openly said that they are not manufactured in clean rooms and they don't need to be manufactured in clean rooms because um they're not they're not adding nicotine now to me that's oh right. <sighs> there's a different there's a there's a difference to make to to because I, I i mix my own at home I well used to mix a lot at home until there the free shit started rolling in eh chandler hey what's that until the free shit started rolling in well yeah <laughs> um yeah so i mean there is a complete difference to mixing your own at home to mixing it to sell you know i i love to be able to sell e-juice i don't think i'd be able to like you say i've just got a liter bottle here i'll just add mix yeah, it all I mean, up in here and at the end of the day if you're making something just for yourself and like one of your beard hairs gets in it or something you ain't gonna care you know you don't care if you find one of your beard hairs in your juice bottle but if you find someone else's beard hair in a bottle of juice yeah. that you paid for <laughs> You've got to really give a fuck, aren't you? Because you don't know if that's come from beard or bush. You have no way of knowing. <laughs> right. right, three weeks ago, 
um, I was doing a test batch of e-liquid in the lab. Now, because <sighs> this is going to come, come across really wrong, not that I couldn't be asked, but because I knew it wasn't being um, – because it wasn't being made for public use, it was literally for testing purposes. Literally 10 litres, that's all we were making. 10 litres of juice. Um, and whilst it was bottled in the clean room, it wasn't mixed in the clean room. Now, when I came to bottle that, the amount of scum and dust and shit that was sat on the top of that juice, I had to waste it. And that was, mm. and that it wasn't in the lab, but it was in a not a a clean room, but it was in a clean environment. It was mm. in a really clean environment, and just from the dust on clothes, just from the dust in the atmosphere, the amount of shit that sat on the top of that liquid, I had to waste a lot. I had to bin the lot, and that was, and that was in a clean environment, not a clean room, but a clean environment. Yeah. yeah. Mark. No one was no one was in in suits. No one was no one had got hair nets on, no one had got beard snoods on. It was literally in our side room, chuck the concentrate in, chuck the VG in, chuck the PG in, mixed it up, took it into the clean room to bottle it. But when we came to bottle it, the amount of scum and shit that was on the top of that, and that was in a clean environment. Imagine what you're getting. Imagine what you're getting in bathroom brewers. Yeah. Those that are mixing in a shed. Those that are mixing in, you know what? It, it... Toilet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, Dale's just sent me a message saying I've just got the same one, mate. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna he's gonna come in. I've sent him the link. Um, he's gonna come in just to clarify. Um what the sort of regulatory stuff was that he was discussing in the chat because i know obviously that's going to be really relevant for for a lot of viewers so um just quickly jennifer you dale used to be a a host on the show um he, he was also a sponsor of the show at one point when that was allowed the show, yeah when it was allowed mm -hmm. um but he's a uh, a large manufacturer in the uk of e-liquid so he also makes our e-liquid so uh <laughs> and one of our ranges too yeah. So he's a business partner, a friend, and a colleague. <laughs> Got it. You won't be able to understand a word he says, though, because he's got a really thick Yorkshire accent. Have we got subtitles? Have we got subtitles? <laughs> Do you want me to translate in chat? There he is. <laughs> Aye. Is that as much as you can move? Aye. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. I'm, I'm stationary. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dale, you said you wanted to come in just to offer a bit of clarity on what you was kind of discussing with um, Sean in the chat about the changes to the regulatory framework with regarding short fills. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not so much a change from the, the TRPR. I mean, every, every, everyone knows the TRPR was put in place to kind of bottleneck the industry to a point where people were just thinking, fuck it, I'm not I'm not going to bother with it, or either fuck it, I can't bother with 10 mils, I'm going to go back to the fags, or no one likes carrying around 10 10 mil bottles when they can have a 100 mil bottle that's comfy in a bag, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as a as an industry, we came to a workaround with short fills. Now, I personally thought they were a good idea from the start, some people didn't, and I still think they were a good idea at the time for, for companies, but in hindsight, what the fuck has happened since like every man and his dog can throw a juice line together and the regulation got rid of the shit and then allowed it straight back in we, we allowed it straight back in as companies yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we opened the floodgates for that yeah and and to be fair, we're, we're all as an industry partly to blame for that but then again our companies could have been severely affected if not right mm -hmm. so what the what the trpr kings and queens have done is thought right shit we can't actually close this loop because a lot of us were worried about the loophole getting closed and then we all sat back and kept scratching our heads thinking well how the fuck can we close this loophole and they're sat back thinking how the fuck can we close this loophole and we both come up with the same answer we can it's unclosable because this i've said this countless times the second you start regulating not milligram e-liquid i'll start selling lubricant right yeah. because it's the same thing 
right? It can be used for the same thing in, in whatever way you spin it, right? There is no way to do it. So it's short, a fantastic cleaning product. Do you know exactly? There's so many things. I mean, I wouldn't say cleaning product because the last thing I want is like I don't want to be vaping sift. But you know, <laughs> like you, there's so many things you can you can clarify it as, right? So the thought, right, shit, this doesn't actually fall under the TRPR, but no product in any country goes unregulated. It falls into some generalised category. In this respect, because it's food flavouring predominantly, and it's an oral substance you can ingest safely as a food, bang, you've got UK food regulations up your ass. then. So then, right, how can we categorise this? Right, well, anything you ingest has to be proven to be safe at the minimalist level. So what they now require, or what, what trading standards are coming back to people with, is right. You can have that on your shelf as a bait product, as a food supplement, as a lubricant, whatever you whatever you want, but you need to prove it's safe. And the closest guidelines to test whether something is safe is the guidelines set out in the nearest thing to it, which is the TRPR regulations, which is regards to the outline of diacetyl, um, AP, and acetoin are actually allowed in there, but under a certain percentage, a very very low percentage. So they're basically saying, you've got to prove that's safe. Now, I could basically drink a full bottle in front of a training standards officer and go, I'm not dead. That's not classed as safe because you could react to it different to how I am. So they're basically saying, you have to go through the TPD without going through the TPD. So the only thing you don't have to do is submit it. So companies like Adapt Medical, who are probably the only compliance company I trust, um, because... I've met Damien face to face. You can talk to him like another person, not a robot who wants to empty your bank account. Right? He's is genuine, and they're basically doing what they're working with the MHRA to create what's called the voluntary submissions register. Um, now, what this basically is, I don't know if you've seen something called TPD.expert. You can go on there and you can search any any ESID number, um, any juice, and it will show you the certification, the non-sensitive information behind the TPD process for that specific liquid and the company's information. They are creating another one mirrored to that, which the MHRA and the training standards are happy to accept based on you have the same testing done, but you haven't had to pay the 150 quid a SKU. You've not had to submit it. You've not had to have it approved. They put it through the test. They come back to you and they say, if that was going through the TPD, it would pass. And they give you a big green stamp, which the MHRA are happy to go on. And that's how they're going to filter out the shit. Now, the testing is a lot more reasonable than the TPD. I'm not going to quote costs because I've worked with Damien quite a while now and he would do a lot of things. So obviously, I've got a slightly better price, but it's a lot less expensive than TPD. But it's expensive enough to weed out shite, if you know what I mean. But at the end of the day, even if these companies, I mean, I'm not going to slate homebrewers because I started with homebrew. That's how I started my company. Now, granted, I only sold it to friends, but still, that's how I started but we always made sure it was safe. So I do agree you need to get rid of shit because I've spent the last three and a half years making stuff safe. I know what Mark's doing is safe. I know that Stu's is safe because of where it's made in the best lab in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and now the, the one thing that TRP had, I, I, I heard just before I came on about the whole lab condition is not being made in labs and stuff. Now the TRPR caused the biggest fuck up ever by basically saying you don't actually need a lab to do it. Now, I personally think that you should have one, and I'm not just saying that because I've got one. I genuinely do because, like you said, Stu, even in the kitchen, you can get a stray beard hair, mm -hmm. right? And that's the standards that the TRPR actually set out. You've got to do it in a in food, health, safety, hygiene regulations for, to, to, to commercial kitchen standards. You can get a beard hair in a Yorkshire pudding, right? <laughs> but in a lab, if you do excrete a beard hair, the chances are it'll get pushed to the floor and exhausted out of the vents. Now, in my opinion, I would rather that happen than have the risk of, a, of like Mark said, the dust in the air from your clothes because in a kitchen, you don't necessarily have to wear the same sort of clothes that you would do in a lab. So the, the, that, that's the TPD's fault. The TPD has turned around and said to people, yeah, make it whatever you want as long as it's a shiny surface, you can wipe it. You know, that, <laughs> that's the conditions that, that our government set out but said, but don't put anything unsafe in there. Don't put any chemical in there over 0.002% because it'll kill you in 200 years. You know, the, the, the whole regulation is bollocks, but that's how they're trying to get us now with UK food regulation based on the fact that they've regulated it and it can be made in an environment that is food kitchen, commercial kitchen standards, but it's got to be proven to be as safe as e-liquid. So they've, they've fucked you from both sides, basically.
But I just wanted to, I couldn't be bothered typing all that out if I were honest. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, I just wanted to say that's, and, and obviously CBD, they're coming hard on now as well, which is ridiculous, but that's another another matter. What What's the story with CBD, though? CBD, and it, it comes in quite a few different forms. Now, e-liquid and CBD is remaining untouched. This is just for things like oil, because obviously oil comes under food supplements. And with this big fucking clamp down on UK food, now, now we're all vaping food. Oh, CBD oil's falling into it, because that's classed as a food supplement. So you can, as of May, you won't be able to use CBD isolate. You'll have to use distillate, which is pretty simple to get hold of. But any companies with a lot of CBD oil in stock, like us, <laughs> have to get rid of that oil pretty quickly because we've only got two months and they only told us about this, I found out about three days ago. Is there a sell-through? Uh, not that I'm aware of. But in all fairness, I, and I'm only doing this because I use a lot of CBD personally, if, like yourself, Mark, if shops have got oil when this comes in, I will happily exchange it for distillate, which is legal because i will vip, i will i will cbd drip the shit out of it so it's not going to go to waste <laughs> <laughs> or worse you're gonna, you're gonna have a lifetime supply of the stuff by the sounds of things yeah pretty much but it's it's one of those things you know that i think there's always going to be a case of sitting around the table thinking or the regulatory boards will sit around the table and think shit <laughs> you know like, what how can we do this now? And they'll find any, if there's a, if there's a hole that water can get in, so can the MHRA, like they will find it. Um, and they're just trying to explore, but I, I do think it's easing off a lot. And I think this last part will actually benefit the industry because every man and his dog won't be able to bring out an e-liquid. Yeah. Um, and unless it goes through stringent processing, basically. You know, those of us that have invested every penny that we've got our hands on into the industry probably really want to see. That. So, um, it's actually kind of reassuring for some of us. Well, we have our finger on the pulse, and when when it comes to the point where we have to submit these flavours in for testing, we're quite fortunate because, like I say, we've always done it. I I will speak to you after this, Stu, but I've preempted something for you, which you'll I'm sure you'll be happy about. But um, yeah, um, it's it's good news as far as I'm concerned. From a manufacturer's point of view, it really pissed me off. Like I've known Mark a long time. From the start, we always did. The, the testing that we felt was necessary to make sure the nicotine accuracy, accuracy was right, to make sure that the shit wasn't in there that shouldn't be in there. Before diacetyl was a thing, we made sure there were no diacetyl in it. Obviously, then AP and acetoin came about, but we made sure the percentages were where they should be. I mean, I know when, when we was designing our flavours, you even limited what concentrate manufacturers we could use to design our flavours so that you stuck within ones that you knew were predictable. We we manage we have we only up until recently we've only worked with three flavor flavor houses really. The reason being they were very very forthcoming with their their safety data sheets. They would always come forward to us with if I said to them right what you know that the, a lot of the flavor companies are very well aware of what you can and can't have now. So that's why they're bringing out V2s of flavors and etc etc etc. You've got these companies, and if they turn around and say whatever you need, whatever information and data sheets you want, you can have it, and they send you it. I will work with those companies because if they're forthcoming about it, they aren't hiding nothing. Yeah. And you will get the odd asshole in the industry who's going, yeah, they'll send you it, but is it true? And you're thinking, I don't know, but if it's in black and white, my ass is covered. You know what I mean? I've done my, from a legal standpoint, I have the paper trail, so as far as I'm concerned, it is. Um, companies like Capella, they are one of the most expensive flavour companies in the world. Yeah, but, yeah they have some of the best flavorings in the world and they are yeah. very very they have a publicly accessible list of things that a green and a red list of what you can use in england and we'll, we'll go through the tpd and what won't and that's accessible to everyone now what pisses me off is some of the companies now who are making the liquid now in their back room in a clean room wherever are using the flavorings on the bad flavoring list because they taste better a flavor to me a flavor engineer can take the ones that are on the good list and make it taste just as good yeah but yeah. it's a lot easier to use so-and-so V1 than having to put four V2s together to get a better effect, which is safer. Yeah. And this is the problem. This is what needs wiping out. Um, but like I said, that the reason we limited people on it is because until we got a go-ahead from a company and we had all the safety information in front of us, we won't put it in our lab. Like a lot of people saying that, though, a lot of people think vanilla custard V1 from Capella has got shit in it. It has got shit in it, 
but it's it doesn't it only comes up as a trace up to a certain concentration within a mix. So if you come to me and said I wanted 15% of XB1 in this mix, I'd say you can't do that because that will show up a higher a higher than legal limit of a certain chemical in your final mix. If you come to me and say, I'll say to you, right, you can use up to 8% of that in an 80-20 mix because it'll be diluted to below the point of traceability where it's then legal. You know, we, we can advise you based on using those for three and a half years and knowing where the levels and the limits are. Mm -hmm. And then we would advise you to reformulate based on that. Some people, and we've had this, some people have gone away and gone, no, nah, it's okay, bro, I'll leave it. And I know for a fact they've released them flavours. Yeah. I'm just thinking, bro, I don't fucking care because at the end of the day, you'll make 20 quid and I'll still be going in a year and you'll be fucked. Well, no, I mean, I, I know me and you have had literally this exact conversation, you know. We've, we've discussed between us, you know, is because is, is, this was my concern, you know. I want my juice to be clean and safe. Have I put anything in my juice that I need to worry about? And, and we had this conversation, we broke it down and we looked at what was in it and we're, we're good, you know. We, we know that, and but, but not every juice manufacturer is doing that. And I think that's the kind of thing that's kind of prompting this sort of overbearing regulation, isn't it? You know, that, that's... That's it. I mean, like I say, I have never thought I would say this word. I would actively lobby for harsher regulation on short fill if I, if I was it, if I felt that my, my voice in that respect would be listened to. But by the looks of it, they're doing it for us, right? And it's the first time I would support the way things are going because... It will. I would like to think that I would like to think my business will still be here in a few years' time, and I would like to think that a lot of my friends' businesses are going to be here in a few years' time. Not just the people who work with us, all my friends' businesses. You know, who have their own businesses. Matt, you know what I mean? You, you've got your own thing going. You know what you're doing with that with that sort of stuff. So I want you to still be in this industry. What I don't want is is the people who have no regards for safety. They care about pound note rather than people's actual safety. Yeah. Pers personally. The diacetyl gate, we'll call it, is a person's prerogative. Me, I would vape anything if I thought it tastes nice, but I'm not advocating that. I'm no. just saying, me personally, I know how long it would take diacetyl in vape form to kill me, so I don't give a shit about it. <laughs> like, At the end of the day, though, what it comes down to is responsibility, doesn't it? We manufacture a product that was invented for the sole purpose of harm reduction. Yeah. That is why vaping was created in China in 2002 by the guy whose name I always forget. That's why it exists. If we lose sight of that, then we become no better than everybody else that we're constantly complaining about. Well, that, also, Sorry, also if we also if we haven't got if we haven't got, I, I'm completely with you on the on the diacetyl. It's like I'd be quite happy to to vape. Oh, it's flavors. fucking delicious, isn't it? Oh, yeah, some of it is great. Delicious. It's just so good. Yeah, <laughs> but if we if we haven't got any diacetyl in any of our vape liquids, that is just one less stick for the naysayers to wave at us. I completely agree. That's why we, we as a company and Stu as a company and Mark as a company, we can't leave it up to people to make that decision because the government have made that for us on a manufacturing basis. There are flavours out there that no doubt have diacetyl in them. I think some of ours will have it in, but it's well below the percentage where yeah. the government's deemed it legal to be present. Um, but like I say, for me as a person, there is no way on earth that I'm going to be vaping. I, I, I very rarely have my mod out of my hand. But for me to be doing that for 200 years is unlikely because I doubt I'll see 50, right? So <laughs> <laughs> with, with my lifestyle, I probably will, you know, I, I'll be lucky to see fucking 60. So let, let's let's say that I, with the 200 year thing, I'm going to be shocked if I live to let that finish me off. So I'm not going to worry about it enough. But considering how many how much shite I put in my body when I was a bit vaping, when I was smoking 50 Lambert a day. I know compared to that, compared, I know for, my, for a guy my size, and I'm not stood up now, but I am a big geezer. I weigh 23 stone. Used to be 24, though. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I know how less out of breath I am now compared to what I used to be. Having a five-year-old running around, you can soon establish your fitness levels from smoking and not smoking. So I, I whether that, like I say, if we don't know the long term yet, but... I've got a pretty good fucking idea. Um, from you know yourself, you, you all know your own bodies, and you know how you all feel. And that's that's my personal opinion on it. But it's the same thing as when a woman comes into the, a, a retail shop trying to buy a fifteen-year-old son an e-cig. I wouldn't sell them, them but yeah. if my son was smoking, I would put an e-cig in his hand because I would much rather him have an e-cigarette 
and as much as you really want to help that parent get their 15 year old or 14 year old off of cigarettes parents prerogative or not you can't sell them it but again if my son was smoking i would give him a slap and an e-cigarette <laughs> yeah cheers Dale. i appreciate that um are we about are we about getting to to sort of wrap up time i think we are it's it's close to 10 o'clock and we did start on time so um I suppose first and foremost, thank you very much to our special. I've got to it doesn't go potato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we've. Honestly, yeah. But I really want, I really want to know what the uh, double barrels like that I've noticed oh, you're waiting for. You can get them over here. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I like it a lot. It's really it. It's way more solid than it looks. I, before I got it, I um. I thought, uh, I, it looks kind of cheap, not cheap, but it just looked not substantial. And it's really, it's solid metal. It's really heavy. I like it. It fits nice in your hand. I like it. Yeah, that might be going on my list at some point. I oh, I hovered over one a couple of weeks ago. Very neat. Yeah, they're a little hard to get over, over here, aren't they? Yeah, there, there is a store that does them over here. They're about 120 quid, I think. Um, yeah. And they've uh, just brought out a new one, haven't they? I know they've brought out. A, uh, uh, yeah, the big one, the one that yeah. takes the twenty-one seven hundred, I think, batteries. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, so, as I was saying, very special thanks to our guest, yep. our amazing guest, Chandler. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Eventually. <Yes. Sorry. laughs> no, seriously, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, it's been amazing having you on the show, and it, it's thanks really. For good some insight from somebody over there that really knows what's going on um, because that's something we don't necessarily always have access to over here so thank you so much for <laughs> taking time out of your day for us one of the things i want to add is <clears throat> obviously we advocate hard over here but if we can if we can advocate overseas if we can advocate you know for the guys in the states that's do it. If it takes two minutes out of your day to advocate on an Instagram page or on a Facebook group, do it. Do it, do Absolutely. it, do it. Exactly. You know, you just because we've got it. Smarter government. <laughs> <laughs> Not so sure about that one, really. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, do, do I have just a minute to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to make a, a comment? Um, it, there there were a couple of really interesting things um that that just sort of got brought up which is how your your regulations sort of created this whole new um you know breeding ground for really shit manufacturers and and sort of the same thing happened here when they made that august 8th 2016 cutoff and when it became apparent that for up until now that they probably weren't didn't have the tools to enforce that they didn't the i think the fda when they threw that that number and that date out didn't understand what what that was going to entail to enforce that and i think they do now and are going to start cracking down but what happened was there was this whole new slew of people that were just like fuck it we're gonna like make the crappiest garbage juice we can we're going to put these labels with cartoons on them that the politicians can parade out into their meetings and say, look, like they're trying to attack, uh, attract the children. And so there's a, and because they're like, whatever, the industry is going to get burned down to the ground anyways, and we're just going to make a bunch of money on it while we can. Um, and that's really problematic here. Um, is is that a problem for you guys the the whole child appealing label thing Absolutely. is that is that a sticking point there too massively you know um yeah over, over here i mean, dale you remember at expo we had a store literally next to us that was full of juices the their branding was all popular chocolate bar wrappers every single one of them you know and it, and it was literally an entire stand full of that kind of juice right beside one of the most reputable companies in the industry literally mm -hmm. side by side i think see i think you've got two you've got two parts there you've got the ones that are just intellectual property theft i don't think they're marking it at kids i think they've just seen 
Skittles being popular and they created Skittles juice and called it Scuttles and it looks exactly the fucking same. I don't think I don't think they've brought. I'm not advocating cartoon and intellectual property that at all, but I do think that the two factors are they've they've seen Skittles are popular and they've gone for it for the money. I don't think they've gone for it targeting children per se, but ideally that's that's how it's come across and I fully understand that. The other bad thing is you've got people doing like refresher and wham bar and, and you know stuff like that. Now the thing is at the moment, I don't know if this is in the States, retro's back right now, like like me getting a NES, a fucking twenty five year old console, that's in at the moment. A lot of people are going back to retro sweets and there's a lot of you know, like American sweet shops popping up over here. Because all the all the stuff that you guys buy is like candy and sweets is just in every store. Over here we pay top dollar for that shit. Like yeah. we'll pay like five pounds for a packet of milk duds. Like, and so that's because anything that's imported, they blame it on import tax and it's bullshit. They just they just charge the fortune for it. Um, I've seen I've seen Reese's all over the place recently. Yeah. yeah. Suddenly, where, where the hell have they come from? That's it. And and the thing is, I think people, I think customers are market. I do think they're marketing it to adults because at the moment, retro in general is back, right? For people, especially around the thirty year old, forty year old mark, they're thinking, shit, I remember that when I was a kid. So they are marketing it to the child mind of an adult who, when they were a kid, but it's getting misconstrued by the government as, shit, yeah. that's a child's chocolate bar. Yeah, it was 25 years ago. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They don't even make that shit anymore. That's, that's absolutely what it is. But I like, like I always say, if, if, you, if it can be construed badly, then you as a manufacturer have a responsibility to assume that it will be construed badly and to adjust yourself accordingly. Completely agree. You know, right. I, think, I think we need to we need to be watching the Wrigley's uh, fiasco and see how how that's going to pan out, because I think that's gonna that's gonna make a big difference for quite a few. Yeah, because they're actually they're suing that e-liquid company, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that'll be that'll be a good thing for the industry. Again, it will be a good thing for the industry. They should be made an example of, and it will stop people doing it. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, whether whether or not they're marketing to children, which clearly, hopefully, nobody is directly marketing to no. children. But when you know that you're under the microscope and the whole industry is under the microscope, and you yeah. parade out bullshit that's gonna, you know, it's super irresponsible, yeah. and it's what all of us have to contend with every day. When people, like I said, someone on my mom's Facebook page is like, well, how is this not marketed to children? And, you know, it's the Fruit Loops bunny or whatever. And I'm like, I've got to you know, I can't defend that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, right. I think we're in danger of banging on endlessly about this. Um, if anybody obviously wants to come into the after show hangouts, um, we, do, we do usually stick around for half an hour. Is everyone sticking around for half an hour tonight? Yeah, can do. Um, I'm so hanging around a little bit. More to say, then feel free to jump in, um, have a chat with us directly. But yeah, um, as well as obviously, thanks to Jennifer, thanks to Dale for popping in uh, to do that little clear up for us. That really helped. Um, that was really nice of you to offer. And um, I guess it's see you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday.